So I think all of us here today are, of course, interested in biodiversity, I think. That is why we are here. But when we talk about biodiversity, what comes to mind is often a picture of something like this, a coral reef or an environment with lots and lots of species and interactions. But when I think about biodiversity, I also think about the genetic diversity. And that is genetic differences within a species, between populations, and also within populations, between individuals. And this level of, of uh, biodiversity is actually a very key part of biodiversity. Without genetic diversity, we have no, we have nothing for evolution to work on. Uh, so it's uh, necessary for species to be able to evolve and adapt to a changing environment. And um, we can think about genetic variation as a kind of a retirement plan for the future. Um, with large genetic variation, we have a lot of options and uh, good possibilities for adaptations in the future. Low genetic variation, you kind of put all the eggs in the same basket and, and uh, populations and species become more vulnerable to, to for example, climate change or pathogens. And that is when we think about it in the long term. But also in short term, genetic variation is beneficial for um, um, for ecosystems and species. And here is an example of that from, from the Baltic Sea, from the southern Baltic Sea uh, of... No, no. There we go. Yeah. It's a, it's a study of eelgrass where it was shown that um, communities of eelgrass with higher genetic variation um, had a much Fa much better recovery after um, a, a heat shock. It was an extremely warm summer. And here you see that these lines show uh, communities with low genetic variation that recovered more slowly than communities with high genetic variation. So also in the short term, genetic variation is beneficial for populations. And this is just another example from the same study. Um, high genetic variation was always associated with a, an increase, a beneficial um, traits for, this, for these populations, both in terms of um, things like, what do you call it? <laughs> The plants were healthier, <laughs> but it was also associated with uh, with um, uh, other species that lives in eelgrass. Eelgrass is a um, it's kind of a nursery, and it's a habitat for a lot of a lot of different species. And so, this study also showed that populations with high genetic variation ho housed more associated species than populations with low genetic variation. So not only is genetic variation important that this, as this long-term evolutionary insurance plan, but it's also important in the short term. And the Baltic Sea is quite a special environment. Um, not least because it's so young. Uh, it has existed in the current st state for only a few thousand years. Uh, and evolutionary speaking, that is an extremely short time. But during this short time, species have adapted to this brackish water environment. Uh, and the even new species have evolved. This is, a, this is the narrow rack. Uh, that is closely related to a bladder rack, but it's an endemic species to the Baltic Sea. And it's a, it has evolved here during the last 10,000 years. And if you think about that in evolutionary terms, that is extremely short. 
Uh, usually when we talk about evolution, we talk about hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years. Here it's just a blink of an eye and we have a new species. But also for other species in the Baltic Sea, the Baltic environment um, is a challenging environment. And this is some result from a very influential paper that came out 10 years ago that looked at genetic diversity in the Baltic Sea compared to species outside the Baltic. And this is marine species. And what we see here is that the genetic diversity of Baltic populations is always lower, or almost always lower, than for Atlantic uh, co populations of the same species. This line shows a one-to-one -one relationship, um, and populations that are under, under the lines have lower genetic variation in the Baltic Sea than in the Atlantic, and populations that are above the line have higher genetic variation in the Baltic than in the Atlantic. And as you see, most species end up here below the line, which means that Baltic populations have lower genetic variation than Atlantic ones. In the same paper, it was also shown that um, Baltic populations are genetically unique. They are differentiated from Atlantic ones. And this genetic break between Atlantic and Baltic species occur at the entrance of the Baltic Sea, which these lines represent for the majority of species. We have some other genetic patterns as well, but for most species, the entrance of the Baltic Sea is where the big genetic breaks are located. So what we have in the Baltic is a situation where we have unique populations, uh, and we also have lower genetic variation than in other places. It means that we have, um, we have a vulnerable ecosystem and we have an ecosystem where species are unlikely to be replaced if they are eradicated. So it's a, it's a system where we really want to protect uh, our populations in. But to be able to protect uh, genetic variation, we need to understand it. And we need to know what it looks like in the nature. And we can do a, um, we can think about three very basic types of population genetic structure that we can classify different species in. Um, we can have a situations where we have distinct populations. That is, within the species, we have populations that are very different from each other, and they are isolated from each other. And um, ex an example of this for, is, for example, salmon or trout in the Baltic Sea. I will talk a little bit more about all these examples. We can also think about a situation where we have absolutely no differentiation at all. We just have one big population. And of course, in a management situation, these two situations are very different from each other. Here, maybe we want to protect each population separately. Here, we need a big management plan for the entire system. And an example of a, of a species that shows this type of population structure is, for example, the European eel, where we see basically no differentiation over the Baltic Sea. And then we can have a sort of a middle a middle ground here, which is when we have genetic differentiation, but we don't see any clear-cut populations. We have more of a genetic decline, a continuous change. And in a system like this, it might be hard to define specific populations that we want to protect. And in this, this system, it might be more important to conserve migration and the ability of individuals to move in the system. And an example of that is northern pike, which I will 
also come back to because a lot of my research has concerned that species. But if we talk a little bit about um, the consequences of these three um, typical types of population genetic structure, we can think about the, the Atlantic salmon in the Baltic Sea. And here we have a very, very clear and strong population genetic structure where each salmon river har harbors at least one genetically unique population. And, this, the, and these populations are highly differentiated from each other. And the reason they are that is that salmon exhibit this very strong homing behavior where they return to the natal stream to spawn and the straying between streams is very, very low. Their, their homing is accurate. Um, and what we see in the Baltic is an FST value of about 10% in some of them. And our FST is a concept that I will come back to several times during this talk, so I will just briefly explain it for you who are not familiar with genetic measurements. But this is this is a measurement of genetic differentiation between populations. And theoretically, it goes between zero and one, where zero is no differentiation at all, and one is completely different, completely different gene variants in all loci. And when I say that it goes between zero and one, 10% um, might not seem like much, but actually, uh, you just have to believe me here that 10% is quite a, quite a large genetic differentiation. And when we talk, also when we talk about this genetic differentiation, what we're actually talking about is neutral genetic variation. Um, we look at parts of the genome that is not coding for any specific loci. Uh, and this neutral genetic variation it's, or differentiation, uh, it's mainly affected by things like migration or population sizes. And these are very relevant. This is, these are things that we really want to, want to study. Actually, genetic, genetics is probably the best tool we have to study mating systems. But when we talk about genetics, we are, of course, also interested in adaptations. Um, and this neutral genetic variation doesn't tell us a lot about adaptations, but it might be associated with, um, with actual adaptations to local environments. And examples of the, this is quite difficult to come about. The experiments often, are often hard to do. So, I will just show you an experiment of salmon that is not from the Baltic Sea, actually, but uh, uh, its results there are extremely interesting and could probably be valid also in the Baltic. So this is an example from Ireland, um, from a system here where salmon is uh, present in a river here, and also in a river very close to here. Um, and these systems are only about five kilometers apart, so they are really, really close to each other. So what this experiment, um, how it was conducted, was that salmon from both these systems were raised in this one system. And then the performance of the, um, of the salmon were evaluated. And the results are seen in these, this graph. I know that it's, it's hard to read it, but what you should focus on is that the two first bars in each of these groups are native salmon, so the salmon that comes from this river system where it also was raised. And the third bar in each group is the non-native salmon that comes from the other river system. And what you see here is that the performance of the non-native salmon is almost always significantly lower than for the native salmon. So much that if you look over the entire lifespan of these salmons, the non-native ones performed about only about 
35% as good as native ones. And if you think about it, that is quite extraordinary adaptation to this local environment. These are only separated by five kilometers. So the environments are extremely similar. They also spend a lot of their life in the exact same environment when they migrate out, out from the rivers. But even so, the adaptation to this environment is strong enough that, it's, that the native ones perform so much better than the non-native ones. And we, we don't have any real examples of this from the, from the Baltic Sea, but um, it's easy to imagine that similar effects could be present also here. Um, and of course, this has a huge management implication because salmon, as many salmonids, is um, um, affected by huge scale releases um, done for conservation purpose uh, and compensatory releases because uh, Hydropower plants obstruct the route up to um, up to spawning grounds, so we have to we have to do these releases to um, um, to conserve populations in the Baltic. But considering these Irish results, it becomes very clear, at least to me, that how important it is to use really use local strains of um, of populations when we conduct releases like this because even populations that come from pretty close by might be maladapted to the, to the local environment. And that is, for most part, done in the Baltic, but there, are, there might be some issues with that also. I also, I'm just gonna briefly mention the eel because it's such a cool example. Um, I haven't been studying eel at all, uh, so, so not well on this. But as you probably know, the, all the eels in the world spawn in one single place. Uh, and I know it says American eel here, we're talking about European eel, but the systems are very similar. So all the eels from Europe go to the Sargasso Sea, we believe at least, spawn there and then come back. And because it's the spawning that really determines the genetic, very genetic structure, they are just one population. So we see actually no genetic differentiation at all between over the entire Europe, definitely not within the Baltic Sea. So this is a situation where we actually only have one single population in the entire Baltic Sea which is quite extraordinary. This is the only example I can think about that, uh, that behaves like this, where we have kind of a global population. And now I'm go uh, we move on to this third, third type of, of species, the, continuous, the species with a continuous change. Uh, we're going to focus on, on Baltic pike, which is my favorite species in the Baltic Sea, so I'm going to stay on this for a little while. And uh, just a short background. So the pike is a original freshwater species, but it has adapted to the uh, low sal sal uh, salinity waters in the Baltic, and it's present all over the, the Baltic coastline. And what is interesting in the Baltic Sea is that there are two spawning strategies for pike. Um, one part of the population spends its entire life in the Baltic Sea, it spawns in the Baltic and it feeds in the Baltic. Whereas one part of the population feeds in, in the Baltic Sea, in the coastal waters, but in the spring, when it's time for spawning, they migrate up freshwater streams and spawn in freshwater. So in that sense, part of the population is very, very much like salmon. They, salmon, they behave like salmon. And this, this freshwater, um, the freshwater type of pike, it also shows a lot of similarities with salmon. Um, this is a system that is pretty well studied in the, in the southern, um, southern Sweden, 
uh, and here it's been shown that the pike returns to these to their natal streams year after year after year. So they have a very strong homing behavior, just like Atlantic salmon. And the FST, the genetic differentiation again, is also about the same the same magnitude as for salmon, about 10% among these streams that are really closely located to each other. And this means that there's, pro there's not a lot of migration between these streams. There's not a lot of gene flow. And also, in these streams, it has been shown that there is local adaptation to, to these streams. For example, here is an example of um, how many larvae that hatched in... Oh, uh, th these have disappeared, but this is in the native environment, and these are translocated. Um, individuals, so they have a much lower hatching success. Um, it's also, if you compare just the neutral genetic variation, the FST values, with other variation in, in body size and growth rate, it's also, it's also shown that there's a huge difference in um, in these quantitative traits, and this means that this also means that there are local adaptations to the specific environments. Uh, and th actually, thinking about it, this is even more extraordinary than what we see for for salmon in Ireland, in some sense, because these individuals are only separated for an extremely short period of time. Um, during spawning, it's just a few weeks, and uh, they migrate from their they migrate from their um, nursery habitats pretty young, and the rest of the time, these populations spend their entire life in exactly the same environment. Even so, we see strong signs of local adaptation. But then we have the brackish water type. Uh, if we just look at pikes in the Baltic Sea and not in the freshwater streams that are, that are connected to the Baltic Sea, we see quite a different pattern. Uh, over the Baltic Sea, instead of, instead of very strong genetic structuring, we find very weak genetic structuring. We have FST values of only about 3 to 4%. And that is compared to 10% between populations that were very close together. Here it's only 3% over the entire Baltic Sea. And these are some results from a pretty recent study that we, that we made, um, where we looked at pike over the entire Baltic coastline and tried to see what the genetic structure looked like. And this is an output from a software called Structure, and it's a method where you feed, the, feed a computer software your genetic information, and then through advanced algorithms, this, genetic, this software tries to find genetic groups um, that look similar and could be sort of populations. Um, and what we see here is that, well, there seems to be some kind of genetic structuring that we find different genetic groups in different parts of the Baltic Sea, but it's not very clear-cut. And actually, at some places, like here, in the islands of Åland and Finnish... Um, uh, around Turku, there's a huge mix, it seems to be a huge mixture of populations. And even more, uh, with this method, you don't. Uh, it, it doesn't only infer the number of genetic groups that you might have in your data set. It also gives an estimate of, for each individual, how likely, what, the, what is the probability that each individual belongs to a certain genetic group. Uh, and that is what you see in this uh, diagram. This is a bar diagram where each bar is one single individual. And what we see here is that uh, 
probability for each individual to belong to one single group is not very high. Most individuals seem to be a mixture of a lot of diff different genetic groups. And if you, if you plot up the individuals that are like, that are surely assigned to one of these genetic groups, that is, they have a probability of 80% to belong to that group, there's not a lot of individuals left. Most, most of these pikes are not really strongly assigned to any genetic group. Um, so this means that we, we actually don't see a very pronounced genetic structure in this system. Uh, and, it, and the reason for this is most likely that we actually have quite a lot of gene flow in the system. We have quite a lot of migration and genetic exchange between different areas. Um, and actually that I seriously doubt that this algorithm manages to find genetic groups. Maybe there almost are no clear genetic groups here. So of course we ask ourselves what, what does the migration pattern look like in the Baltic Sea for pike? Um, and here, you should also think about the biology of pike. Pike is a, pike is a, considered to be a very sedentary species, a sit and wait predator, it doesn't move around a lot. And this um, conception is now being challenged by a lot of people around the world actually, but this is still the, uh, the feeling that we have for pike, that it doesn't move around a lot. Um, so we looked at different patterns of migration in the Baltic Sea. Um, and what we actually find is it's something that is called an isolation by distance pattern. And that is, if you look at this, it means that the genetic differentiation increases with geographic distance. That is, populations or... Uh, groups that are close geographically to each other will look more similar genetically than groups that are far away from each other. And that is a pretty logical, it's, it's not a difficult concept to, to imagine. And this kind of <coughs> genetic pattern occurs when there is migration in a system and the migration primarily takes place between neighboring populations or groups. And because pike is a coastal species, we, we, look, we measured this, uh, this geographic distance in different ways in the Baltic. So we, started, we actually started out with just looking at coastal populations and measuring the ge geographic distance like along the coast here, like if migration took place only along the coast. But then we got this pattern. We saw no, um, no correlation at all between geographic and genetic distance. And we only got a very strong and significant correlation when we included island populations and allowed for migration, for example, over the island of Åland between Sweden and Finland. And this suggests that there is some kind of gene flow going on here. Um, it also suggests that deep water, which we find here between um, Sweden and Åland, doesn't necessarily need to be a barrier for the species to migrate. But in some cases, they might be able to, to cross this deep water, which is a little bit unexpected for a for a species that is so associated with coastal waters. What we do have also in the Baltic Sea is that we have, we have some homing at least. Uh, and we can see that, that here where we see that the genetic differentiation between populations or between groups is much higher in the spring, which is close to spawning time, than later in the season, or like in the, in the autumn and the winter, we see that the genetic differentiation between populations becomes very low. And this is probably due to um, spawning groups aggregating for spawning and then 
during the rest of the year, they spread out and they mix with each other and we don't see these big genetic differences. So what we have in Pike is, um, is a system where um, it becomes quite complicated. We have a system that uh, is a mixture between um, very clear populations for the freshwater spawning ones, um, together with something that looks more like a continuous genetic change for the brackish water spawning pike. And we also have a temporal aspect here where we have more pronounced genetic differentiation around spawning than during feeding times, which means that spawning populations mix during feeding. And when we fish on these populations, we might not be entirely sure on what population we are actually uh, fishing on. Uh, this, is a, this is a concept that is well known in, for example, salmon management. But it's pro it might also be relevant for other species as we see here. So, so in a system like this, it's, it's difficult to give management advice. How do, you, um, how do you decide what the size of the management unit should be when you have a complete and continuous change? And this is a, 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 an attempt to, to do that where the um, and to identify the size of a genetic patch, which is within this gen geographic distance, individuals are more genetically similar than ra uh, individuals taken at random. And for Pike in the Baltic Sea, this genetic patch is about 150 kilometers, which means that a management unit should perhaps be around this size, then exactly how this is going to be organized, um, 150 kilometer patches, how they're going to relate to each other, is not entirely clear to me, and I don't think it's entirely clear to ever anyone. But a genetic structure like this, with a continuous change, with a lot of migration in the system, is probably something that is uh, present for a lot of different species. So, uh, it is a challenge that management has to deal with. So, I, I've been talking a lot about genetic variation and how important it is. And this is not only me thinking that this is important, but actually the entire world thinks that genetic uh, diversity is something that we need to conserve and we need to manage it. And it's very clearly stated, for example, in the Convention on Biological Diversity, that um, um, genetic variation should be conserved. And this is something that is ratified by almost all um, almost all countries in the world. But the question is, how do we implement these international conventions? Um, we, we did a study where we looked at um, different policy documents, both on an international level and also on a national level and on a very local level of uh, marine protected areas in the Baltic Sea to see how, ca how can managers actually implement this uh, theoretical knowledge that genetic diversity is important to conserve. And what we saw in this study was that in international um, agreements, like especially the Convention on Biologi Biological Diversity, um, the importance of conserving genetic variation is very clearly stated. Uh, it's shown here by green DNA, DNA symbols. But then there's a lot of variation in different types of documents. In some documents it's mentioned, but it's not emphasized. In some documents it's barely mentioned at all. Um, so how can managers actually make use of this information. It becomes very hard. Also, if we go, if we go down the level, this is, these were the inner big international conventions that we are legally have to follow, but they are very broad. So if we go down to the more national level, there's still a variation among different policy documents. Um, 
Some mention genetic diversity pretty strongly, some don't. But the problem is that if we go down to the very local level, in the management plans for marine protected areas, and this is where the actual management is taking place, then genetics is almost never mentioned at all. And this becomes a problem, of course, because how are we going to implement these huge um, international conventions if we, don't, if we don't have any practical plans for doing it? This is uh, just some quotes from an interview study uh, from Sweden and Finland of uh, ground-level managers. And the questions were, how do we, how do we implement genetic variation? Uh, in, in the management plans of MPAs. And basically what everyone says, or most people say, are that they know theoretically that genetic variation is important, but there is not a culture of incorporating it in management. There are no clear directions of how to do it. And it's actually we don't have enough information to be able to implement it effectively in management. So this is a problem. How do we how do we help the managers to um, to implement genetic variation? Uh, I see that I am running out of time, so I will go a little bit quick here. Um, well, what we have to do as scientists is to, of course, describe. Uh, describe these genetic patterns that we find, but also communicate our results in a clear way that it's easy to follow and easy to, um, easy to implement in management. And I, I just want to mention that we did a study where we compared a lot of different species, and the outcome of this study uh, was that each single species seems to show a different, uh, unique genetic pattern. So what we really need is species-specific studies and species-specific advice. We cannot generalize between species that what, a, what generally a good advice for conserving genetic variation is. Um, and what we have done also is that because we cannot generalize, we wanted to know, so what do we know about genetic variation in the Baltic Sea? Um, and this is a review study where we looked up how much information there is about genetic patterns. There's over 200 studies published that describe some kind of genetic patterns for species in the Baltic Sea. Over 60 species are described. And there is a, there, there seems to be a, um, high interest among scientists to communicate or to make use of these results in management because about half of studies um, give some kind of management advice. And even, so, even though it is like that, it is not implemented in actual management. And one reason for this is probably that this information is so vast and it comes so quickly. This is a, a graph over the number of studies that have been published over the um, over the last 50 years, you can see it increases exponentially. So uh, the information is just coming in and coming in. And how do we uh, how do we give this information in a clear way to managers? So what we have tried to do is to classify the amount of genetic knowledge or the degree of genetic knowledge for species in the Baltic Sea based on for example, how well, how much of the Baltic Sea is covered in the studies, how, um, what type of genetic markers are used, how we look at neutral genetic variation or adaptive genetic variation, uh, are temporal aspects uh, taken account for in studies. And what we see then is that out of these 60 species that are studied, it's actually only a few that have a very comprehensive genetic knowledge. Uh, most of them, most of the species, for most of them, we have quite limited genetic knowledge. But even so, finding this knowledge is challenging. Um, 
what we did in this publication was to try to um, organize, the, organize the information in a way that would be relevant for managers. But of course, this is just um, this is a scientific publication, and this is a snapshot in time. And as we see, the, um, the information is coming in all the time, and it's it's huge, uh, huge amounts of information. So what we what we did here was that to summarize what we know about genetic diversity and also what we know about management advice based on genetic variation. But what we really want to do is, of course, communicate the, these advice to a wider audience in a way that is easy accessible and also easy to update. Uh, and this is currently being done. Um, it's a web page that has been around for a while, but it's currently being updated with new information. And the thought about this is to create a database where we can where managers or anyone can find this type of information. Go and look at your species that you're interested in. See what information there is about genetic patterns. And, uh, or if you're a researcher, maybe fill in new information that we have so that we can have an updated, um, an updated flow of information. Um, and yeah, I will, I will stop there with with this and just, because I think I'm running out of time. Yes, excellent. So that is all I wanted to say. Uh, I want to thank all my collaborators, of course, especially the one in the Bambi project, which is um, where we are um, collecting all this genetic information. Thank you for having me. <laughs>